One thing we know in our industry is not to underestimate cells. Yes, our knowledge and use of cells forms the basis of our industry. Cells are the building blocks of all life as we know it. It doesn't get more basic than that. Today, we're going to focus on two ways in which cells are proven to be anything but boring or average. And that's what matters on today's episode of Discovery Matters. Uh, so my name is Dr. Brett J. Kagan, I'm the Chief Scientific Officer over at Cortical Labs. We're a small, about three years old startup based in Melbourne, Australia, and we are interested in exploring biological intelligence and how it might be harnessed and what one could do if one could harness biological intelligence in a dish. Now, Brett is part of a team harvesting brain cells and teaching them to play the classic video game Pong. Do you remember Pong, Connor? Did you ever play it? I played Pong. It was fantastic. And you know those kind of like twisty hand things? I used to get very frustrated when they got stuck. So yes, Pong was a great one. And I think I can mentally hear the Anyway. I think most of the audience are like, what are they talking about? I think... (laughs) (laughs) but you can find the research papers in our show notes so do have a look at what brett and his team were doing and as a fun fact it's been 50 years since pong was released and really all it is is a toy example to answer this question can we actually get biological neurons to show us that they can act intelligently in a dish Because the one thing we know about biology is that it can lead to a generally intelligent creature. So flies, cats, rats, humans, whatever, we're all able to show a degree of general intelligence that we're not yet able to actually recreate with machine learning. The question becomes, how is it possible? Explain the relationship now then between brain cells, understanding intelligence and machine learning. I mean, how does Brett bridge the brain cells in a dish which are biological and a living form and machine learning, which is something which happens now in animate computers? A lot of people, they look at neuroscience and biology as an inspiration for machine learning. And in a lot of ways, that's how we started out. There was a lot of calls from a number of very prestigious researchers and developers in the machine learning space saying, let's advance machine learning by re-engaging back in the neurosciences. And our group took that incredibly literally, probably more literally than anyone else, I think it might be fair to say. The team set out to figure out the algorithms of intelligence, as it were, which, if implemented to machine learning, I mean, just imagine how powerful that would be. You can look at like artificial neural networks as an example of a huge reach in that direction. However, our thinking around that has changed. And now we're less about can we implement this in a machine learning? Because I think our conclusions become you probably can't. And that's simply because biology at its basic physical level, it's very plastic, it's changeable, it's adaptable. The number of connections between any neuron and its fellow neurons is huge. Not We don't have this in neuromorphic, we don't have this in machine learning with any reasonable scale. And so we've kind of come to the conclusion now that the right question isn't necessarily, you know, that we ain't really want to recreate this in machine learning, but what can biology do that machine learning can't do? And that's a different sort of question, because it's sort of saying, like, why mimic or recreate what you can harness? And is it even possible to recreate or mimic it? This involved using two different types of cells taken from either an embryonic mouse or human-induced pluripotent stem cells. So this is a type of pluripotent stem cell, which in theory means it could turn into anything else in the body. Brett and his team differentiated it into a neuron using small molecules. They used a multi-electrode array, essentially a computer chip that can sense the smallest of changes in electrical activity. So I presume that that can tell them when the brain cells are active and, you know, when the neurons generate small pulses of electrical activity, you can see that they're alive and they're doing their thing, right? Precisely. That's it. And that allowed the team to read the cells to see how they're behaving and how they are active. So with this technology, you can deliver small electrical pulses at certain locations at certain times. And that is what the team computed into the chip. 
So we have our cells, we have them on a chip, and we can read and write information through electricity, because electricity is a shared language between the silicon and the biology, to communicate with them. Now, of course, the real challenge, as it were, because people have been doing that for a long time, is to figure out how do you actually communicate? What language are they speaking to actually convince a group of brain cells that otherwise would just happily do their own thing to do something very specific? And that's where this whole idea that we talk about in the paper comes in. This is a very broad principle-based theory about how intelligence might arise, but in the simplest possible terms, it suggests that biological systems such as us, such as cells in addition and everything in between, what they want to do is try to create a predictable world. And so we set it up so that in order to create a predictable world for themselves, these neurons have to behave in such a way as to hit the ball. They, there's no reward or punishment, they're very simple systems. And so we're trying to do this at a very, very fundamental level. And, and I think that was the really exciting thing to show in this work. So why Pong? Why pick a 50-year-old, albeit awesome, computer game that is simply about making sure that you hit the ball into the right place? So Pong has incredibly clear win or lose conditions. And Pong happens in real time. So it's not a move that you have to wait for a response to then make the subsequent move. Okay, so that's why it's not chess or backgammon, right? That's right, because those games are not continuous. You make a move, then you wait for your next turn, kind of like children and dogs. It's hard to teach cells to wait for their turn. It's like playing with your cat. Cats don't understand taking turns, and there's no reason a group of cells on a dish would either. But every simple system does learn to operate in real time. You know, flies, worms, they move around in the real world continuously. And so we needed a game where there was a close to continuous control and gameplay. And Pong fit the bill, easily recognizable. One of the first games used for machine learning, one of the first games at all. So that was why we, we picked it, you know. Nostalgia definitely played a role, but it also met a bunch of other criteria. This is hilariously creative. It's a fun study, but surely the team aren't driven entirely by fun. I know, and now I think, Connor, you can probably tell who is asking the questions with Brett on the phone, because I was like, woo, that just sounds like never-ending fun. In reality, Brett was keen to point out that everyone on the team is passionate about what they do, but they're driven by their impact that they can bring to the world and people in need. So in fact, a very serious mission for this team. I sat down with Hon, who's the CEO, not too long after I started. And I said, you know, why are you doing this? You could make more money elsewhere. You could do this, you could do that. So why is this like what you want to be part of? Like for me, I knew why I wanted to be part of it. Why do you want? And he sort of said, oh, it's a legacy. I want to leave a legacy of having done something in the world. And that's exactly how I felt. And I think that really does guide the team. We're here because we see something in the world that could maybe be brought out to make it better in maybe a very small way, maybe not. But that's something that excites us and drives us forward. And, you know, we think you can do that with some good humor and interesting approaches. And you know, we'll see what the world sort of takes from it. So this then brings us to what Brett sees as the future for the team's research. What, what is it? It is so hard to know what 10 years down will bring. I'm a scientist at my heart, and I've always been fascinated by intelligence. So if we could figure out some unified theory or understanding of how intelligence is arising at this most fundamental level and how we can use it in 10 years from now, a very big goal, I know. But that would be an amazing dream to come true, to understand how this could be done. And the implications for that, as well as I said, for drug discovery and disease modeling, hopefully we can start to tackle some of the things that really afflict people in a more personalized way. Currently, drug discovery, uh, disease modeling, it's done by averages. But we know that people in a clinic, they don't respond based on what the average is, they respond based on how they respond, right, in a personalized way. And so we need to now move. And I'm not the only one saying this, of course, but I do am a big believer that we need to move the testing, the clinical trial and the actual clinic from the, you know, leveraging the idea of the average response is this to your genetic response is most likely going to be that. Or we can even test it. We can culture cells from you in a dish. We can test. And so like these these aspects, I think, are what the most exciting things for sort of 10 years from now. And that would be personalized medicine at a crazy scale. 
Induced pluripotent stem cells are an amazing technology. And I think, you know, when you couple it with this synthetic biological intelligence approach, it opens up so many options for people. Brett's comment on averages is a perfect segue into our next conversation. Now, we started off this episode talking about how important cells are to our understanding of life when it comes to the relationship between cell growth, DNA replication, and division in a bacterial system. There has been a tendency to base our understanding on the average, and I'm using my air quotes. Can you see my air quotes? Average life of a cell. So it's kind of important then for us to know what's really happening inside each individual living cell, right? Yes. And in a new paper, a team of biologists and physicists from Washington University in St. Louis and Purdue University used real single cell data to create an updated framework for better understanding this relationship in bacteria cell growth. And again, as ever, you can find the paper in our show notes. Yep. Do go and read our show notes and read these papers in full. There were four authors involved in the study, Petra Levine, Srividya Iyer Biswas, Kunal Joshi, and Sarah Sanders. We spoke with Petra and Kunal. I'm at Washington University in St. Louis, and I work on bacteria, some pathogens, some non-pathogens. E. coli can do both, pathogenesis and non-pathogenesis. And I really got interested in being a biologist, although I'm actually the daughter of a biologist in college because I had some really great teachers and I got to design experiments myself. And just having the ability to think through a problem and think how to solve that problem and being able to actually execute it in a laboratory situation is awesome. So I'm a physics PhD student at the Ayer Biswas lab at Purdue. And well, my childhood dream was to be a physicist, but not necessarily biophysicist. I actually joined this biophysics field after I came to Purdue. Before coming to Purdue, I wasn't that exposed to biophysics. I was more exposed to more of the popular science field. So I guess I didn't have a chance to appreciate the stuff that's going on in biophysics before then. But then after coming to Purdue, I guess I got more exposure to stuff that happens here in this field. They wanted to figure out how these stochastic cells, meaning having a random probability distribution pattern, how these stochastic cells manage to coordinate DNA replication with growth and division so that overall events happen in the right sequence despite the noisiness of each process. And so what are they getting at? Why, why the need to understand this? Here's one way of looking at it. If you're trying to design antibiotics, you cannot just target the average cell because then it won't work on any cell. It's kind of like aiming for a common denominator that just doesn't exist. And one analogy, and this came from our producer, Beth Armit Brewster, who said that while she was studying, they looked at a story from the Second World War when the UK's Royal Air Force tried to design cockpit seats that all pilots would fit. So they took an average not a single pilot. They just averaged all of these pilots and built a cockpit. It fit no one. It fit zero because they aimed for the average. Oh, so everyone was either too big or too small or too wide or too... Okay, so I guess you can't do the same thing and hope that it works for all bacteria. That's right. If you design an antibiotic that essentially kills only the average cell, but then actual cells are different from average cells, because the average cell, it might not work on all the cells, right? But what Kunal just said is true, because you have slow-growing cells and fast-growing cells in the population. When you hit them with an antibiotic, the ones that are growing slowly, those guys are much less sensitive to the antibiotic. So your analogy is perfect. <laughs> Explain some of the observations then behind their study. Well, you might know E. coli as that wicked bacteria that results in recalls of lettuce or fresh produce. But for scientists, it's delightful because E. coli reproduces very quickly and at a large scale. And in gene cloning, due to the high efficiency of introduction of DNA molecules into cells, so the team looked at single cell growth data from E. coli collected by the June Laboratory at the University of California, San Diego. 
They then constructed a mathematical model that captured the complex stochastic behaviors of individual cells. So the observations are much more about how to remove that average is good and really try to identify what's happening at an individual level, yeah. We were looking at results from population-based experiments initially that other groups had already found. And so there's replication speed, which is the speed at which the replication fork progresses in the DNA replication process. And what was known at that time was that there are two types of uh, replication, single fork and multi-fork replication in the bacteria we are studying. And that essentially means that in single fork replication, the DNA only doubles once in a cell cycle. And then in multi fork replication, the DNA can multiply multiple times. So, as in, it can do this preemptively for future divisions as well. Yeah, I think there are different modes of replication where the cells can start one round and complete a round between birth and division, but they can also sometimes start a new round of replication before they finish the previous one. And so they're kind of doing two at once. And there used to be that only fast growing cells would start new rounds before they finish old rounds and slow growing cells always finish a round before they start a new round. And if you go into the single cell data, for example, that's not true. If you look at population average data, it's true. That is a great example of where there was a disconnect because single cells start new rounds before they finish old rounds. You didn't have to be fast growing to be starting new rounds before you finish old rounds. So that was already a disconnect in the literature. There were other disconnects though, that in the literature on population average, it looked like cells initiated new rounds of replication and then wait a certain amount of time before dividing as if those two things, those two, we call them timers are connected. Like you are born, you wait a certain amount of time or you know grow a certain amount, then you initiate a round of replication and then you have a certain amount of time and then you finish and then you have a certain amount of time and you divide. So that was extremely surprising. So that essentially means two things. One, the plateauing out of the replication speed at higher population-based growth rates isn't caused due to this uh, multifoc replication directly, at least. And the second thing was, why is it that we observe this shift between single fork and multi fork replication at this point? What's the reason behind the multi fork replication? So initially, the general assumption in the community was that if the replication speed increases beyond the threshold, then that would give rise to multifoc replication period. But now we notice that in this same single cell experiment, we have both single fork and multifoc replication with the same replication speed. So replication speed is not this direct factor that we thought it was. Essentially, they found that unlike others who thought that DNA replication and cell division are dependent on each other, there's a correlation and it's independent. And it reminded me of when we talk about manufacturing, when we talk about starting processes before another process has completed so that you really can make the overall process a lot more efficient. And so Canal could predict the sequence of DNA replication initiation, the end of DNA replication and division, based on when the three timers independently go off and reset. That kind of shifts how we understand the basic process of a cell's life cycle. And that's the whole point of their paper, that's right. What have you learned this week, Dodie? I, you know, I was looking at science.org, which is a great place to go down rabbit holes and look at some interesting studies that scientists are doing. And uh, there was a study done in the University of Würzburg about the total biomass on the earth and comparing wild mammals to humans. And what is the total biomass of humans compared to the total biomass of wild mammals? What do you suppose is more? It can't be. We c there can't be more of us. Although maybe, like, you know, with current eating habits, maybe there is more biomass of humans. <laughs> 
That's the thing. That's the thing. So as I understand it, the human biomass comes in at 390 million tons. And then when you add on urban rats and livestock, actually, then you come up to 630 million tons. No. The wild mammals are not that much Wild land mammals have a total biomass of just 22 million tons. Is that it? That's it. And marine mammals, just 40 million tons. So it's just amazing. Think of the resources that we're consuming. It's insane. It's extraordinary. Yeah. Wow. That's kind of terrifying. Um, you know, so you add humans and, and then what they eat, and you're way above you know, what the earth is supporting in terms of wild mammals. Given that learning is what we're really focused on, and every day is a school day, who knew that I would learn from my dearest darling daughter that wearing an eye mask during overnight sleep improves, guess what, your episodic learning and alertness the following day. Wearing a what? An eye mask, you know, those kind of funky little eye masks. No! My daughter has one with eyes painted on it, but you know, you get them. Or that you get on an airplane if you want to sleep. Yeah, exactly. So this is based on the fact that ambient light influences sleep. And even if your eyes are closed, if there's ambient light in your bedroom or say from an alarm clock or from, you know, peeking around under a blackout blind or what have you, or even like a flashing light on a fire alarm or a router or whatever it is that you may have in your room, that can actually affect your sleep because that light can shine through your eyelids. So this was published last year in December, but this team looked at how ambient light influences sleep structure and timing. And they found that if you wear an eye mask, you learn better and you are more alert and more focused the following day when you sleep. Um, so I immediately tried this last night. I put a mask on because I have a few of those lurking around in travel bags and stuff. And you know what? I woke up this morning feeling refreshed, having deeply slept and not at all bothered by the flashing light of the alarm clock, always <laughs> telling me how little sleep I have left. So there you go. I confirm the study. Wear an eye mask when you sleep, kids. Well, we will do that. And you know what? If you want to wear an eye mask while you listen to Discovery Matters, we're open to that. Focus with us. Our producer is Beth Armit Brewster. Editing, mixing, and supervision is by Ulrika Svensson and Tom Henley from Banda Productions. Music is by Epidemic Sound. You've been listening to me, Dodie Axelson. And to me, Connor McKechnie. Make sure you rate us on Spotify or whichever platform you use to listen to your podcasts. We'll I struggle with this. See you? Question mark. When we come back with another episode of Discovery Matters. Bye for now. Bye for now.